Last week we discussed the mechanism of action of antipsychotic medications and concluded that most antipsychotic medications exert their therapeutic benefit by virtue of blocking the dopamine receptor. This lecture touched upon the dopamine hypothesis and its dominant place in thinking about the causes and treatments of schizophrenia. We are now going to take a closer look at various theories of schizophrenia causation, and we'll start this series of examinations by looking at the case for glutamate as a cause of schizophrenia. Most people, when they think about schizophrenia, will think about dopamine. This is because of the previously mentioned dominance of the dopamine hypothesis, which is formed in part by the dominance of dopamine receptor blocking drugs as the treatment modality for schizophrenia. In fact, all medications that are recognized for, by the FDA as treatment for schizophrenia have dopamine receptor blocking as a central role, with the arguable exception of clozapine and, to a lesser extent, of quetiapine. However, astute observers will notice that there are some limitations to this theory and to this medication approach. First of all, dopamine receptor blocking drugs don't address all the symptoms of schizophrenia. They do a fairly good job for most people at reducing the severity of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, but they do a comparatively weaker job at alleviating the negative symptoms as well as the cognitive symptoms of the illness. And the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia has a major gap in explaining how clozapine can behave as the most effective of the antipsychotic medications, yet being the weakest in interacting with the dopamine receptors. And finally, we have to uncomfortably acknowledge that some significant portion of people with schizophrenia will not derive satisfactory results from available non-clozapine antipsychotic drugs. And so the existence of a fairly large population of schizophrenia-affected people who derive very little benefit from dopamine receptor antagonists suggests that a significant portion of people with schizophrenia have a disease process which is mediated by something other than excessive dopamine signaling activity. In the next several weeks, we'll look at a variety of different mechanistic hypotheses to explain schizophrenia. This week we'll focus on the glutamate hypothesis, which is arguably the most important of the non-dopamine competing hypotheses to explain schizophrenia causes and to guide schizophrenia pharmacotherapy. Glutamate is the most important neurotransmitter that many people have never heard of. It is used, in fact, by the majority of synapses in the brain, so it is, numerically speaking, the most important of the neurotransmitters in the CNS. It is an amino acid, and it is used by the brain as a neurotransmitter, so it's called one of the amino acid neurotransmitters. Glutamate synapses are almost exclusively excitatory. Other important amino acid transmitters include aspartate, which is also excitatory, and glycine and GABA, which are both inhibitory amino acid neurotransmitters. Being the brain's most widely circulated neurotransmitter, it's easy to understand how even relatively small disruptions in glutamate signaling might produce a wide variety of psychiatric symptoms. And there is fairly extensive evidence to support a glutamate signaling abnormality as being relevant to the expression of symptoms in schizophrenia. The earliest observations were of decreased glutamate levels in the cerebrospinal fluid of people affected by schizophrenia. Those findings proved difficult to replicate, but in contrast, the findings are highly replicable that drugs which antagonize the glutamate signal at the NMDA subtype of glutamate receptor can reliably produce symptoms which are very reminiscent of those seen in people with schizophrenia. In fact, um, advocates argue that these psychotomimic effects of drugs like PCP or ketamine uh, recapitulate schizophrenia pathology to a much more accurate extent mm -hmm. than do drugs which simply stimulate dopamine signaling. The dopamine signal stimulators can very reliably produce paranoia and hallucinations, so they can very nicely recreate a set 
of positive symptoms of schizophrenia, but drugs like ketamine or PCP not only produce hallucinations, but they also produce cognitive impairments, negative symptoms, and can recapitulate electrophysiological abnormalities um, that are commonly seen in people affected by schizophrenia. We also have naturally occurring examples uh, whereby the glutamate signal is reduced by virtue of autoimmune diseases which interfere with glutamate receptor antibodies. And one of these diseases is NMDA receptor encephalitis, which can produce initially symptoms that are identical to schizophrenia, including, catatotics, including catatonic symptoms. And additionally, genome-wide association studies have reliably found genes relevant to glutamate signaling as associated with schizophrenia risk. So it seems to be an important neurotransmitter system. This slide illustrates just one facet of the importance of the glutamate signaling system to schizophrenia. Here we're looking at a study by Polovsky and collaborators in which they look at the density of NMDA receptors in people with schizophrenia who were not taking antipsychotic medication. And what you'll see is that there is a decreased density of the glutamate receptor in the hippocampus. I chose this slide to not only illustrate the relevance of glutamate, but also to introduce more formally the NMDA subtype of the glutamate receptor. As is the case for most all neurotransmitters that I'm aware of, a single neurotransmitter molecule, in this case glutamate, will have a variety of different proteins that can receive and transmit that signal. So a single neurotransmitter can have a variety of different neurotransmitter receptors. In the case of glutamate, there are two broad families of neurotransmitter receptor. Uh, there is one family that is known as the metabotropic family. Uh, these receptors will take the glutamate signal and turn on second messenger activity either in the form of phospholipase C or in the form of adenyl cyclase which will affect intracellular cyclic AMP levels. So those are the metabotropic family of receptors. The family of receptors that we're interested primarily for this discussion are the ionotropic receptor family. Uh, they're named ionotropic because these receptors are all ion channels. They exist in the cell membrane. When glutamate binds to the ion channel uh, receptor, it induces a change in receptor configuration, which then allows ions to move through. Um, ions in question would be either sodium or calcium or both, depending upon the receptor. And the result of stimulation of the ionotropic receptor by glutamate is depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, resulting in action potentials being more likely to be propagated. And within the ionotropic receptor family, there are three broader subfamilies. Each one of them are named according to the drug that was originally used to discover them. So in the ionotropic receptor family, we see this the quisqualate receptor family, uh, the kinate receptor family, and the N-methyl diaspartate, or more simply, the NMDA receptor family. And we're going to focus primarily on the NMDA receptor family for the rest of this discussion, because NMDA receptors um, generally are shown to be hypofunctional. In other words, they transmit the glutamate signal less efficiently in people affected by schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Although we don't understand the primary cause for NMDA receptor hypofunctioning in schizophrenia, we do know that the NMDA receptor, if hypofunctional, is set up to have both direct and indirect effects that impact neurotransmitter systems, which we know to are involved in schizophrenia. So first, there's a direct pathway in this schematic by Susui and colleagues, uh, represented by the blue line on the left, in which hypofunctioning of the NMDA receptor uh, simply leads to decreased activity of this excitatory neurotransmitter signal in areas of the brain where excitatory signaling is important. For example, in the frontal cortex, where um, excitatory signaling is presumed to mediate uh, ultimately features such as attentiveness and cognition.
NMDA receptor hypofunctionality has some complicated steps whereby it can impact serotonin signaling and as we saw uh, serotonin is related to dopamine signaling and ultimately may be responsible for some of the actions of antipsychotic drugs. We've also seen that uh, excessive serotonin activity can produce psychotic symptoms. And, and finally, mediated by GABA interneurons, uh, decreasing inputs from NMDA receptor circuits uh, can ultimately translate into excessive release of dopamine, uh, and thus NMDA receptor hypofunction can also account for the signs of dopamine excess, which are more uh, widely appreciated and understood in schizophrenia pathophysiology. We also know that in schizophrenia, we see cortical atrophy, so there's evidence of neurodegeneration. Um, and if you look microscopically at individual nerve cells in postmortem tissue, it's been repeatedly shown that synaptic plasticity um, is altered. Specifically, the number of dendrites or connections between nerve cells are smaller in number. The the nerve cells in people's in the nerve cells in brains from schizophrenia affected individuals appear excessively pruned. Uh, glutamate is a neurotransmitter which is very important for synaptic plasticity and controls the processes of cell survival or programmed cell death. So having higher levels of glutamate can account for excessive synaptic pruning and for neuronal cell loss. And we see that in models of NMDA receptor hypofunction, with great reliability, you will see increased levels of extracellular glutamate, um, which in animal studies translates very well into excessive glutamate release. So NMDA receptor hypofunction can also set up a cascade whereby glutamate levels are increased, glutamate release is increased, and cell death and excessive pruning can result. Up to this point, we've considered evidence for glutamate signaling abnormality in schizophrenia, and we've looked at the mechanisms whereby a glutamate signaling distortion could account for some aspects of the cellular pathology of schizophrenia. A good hypothesis should also be able to predict treatment options, and the glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia has indeed done so. Uh, assuming again the primary defect is decreased efficiency of signal transmission through the NMDA receptor, one therapeutic approach is to look for agents that can augment signaling through that receptor whose function is diminished in the disease state. It turns out that there are several agents which are naturally occurring, uh, for example, the amino acids glycine or serine, as well as the amino acid derivative sarcosine which do function as glutamate signal augmenting agents at the NMDA receptor. And each of these agents has been shown in at least initial clinical studies to have beneficial effects in relieving symptoms of schizophrenia. Notably, in some of these studies, those beneficial effects were realized in patients that still experienced significant symptoms despite being treated with clozapine. Many clinicians are unfamiliar with the use of glycine, serine, or sarcosine as potential treatment options in schizophrenia. However, most clinicians have heard of memantine, lamotrigine, or topiramate. Um, most people have heard about minocycline, which is an antibiotic, um, although the familiarity with its potential benefits in schizophrenia is less well known. The thing that all these agents have in common is an ability to inhibit glutamate release or to block the actions of glutamate antagonists. And for each of these drugs who act by virtue of impacting glutamate signaling, there are more than one clinical study suggesting beneficial effects in people with schizophrenia. So clinical experience with glutamate modulating drugs is supportive of the glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia and eventually as we're better able to work out more specifically the roles of glutamate in symptom production we should be better able to match these medications for the patients that are most likely to respond to them. So to summarize there is abundant evidence of a glutamate signaling abnormality in schizophrenia, 
and this abnormality is probably relevant to the production of many of the signs and symptoms of the illness. Most theories of glutamate revolve around uh, a primary defect in the sensitivity or the ability of the NMDA receptor to transmit the glutamate signal. This abnormality is sufficient to explain aberrant signaling in a variety of neurotransmitter systems also known to be affected in schizophrenia. And finally, the glutamate hypothesis is able to predict novel pharmacotherapeutic approaches to schizophrenia treatment and, in, and is indeed supported by observations that a variety of glutamate modulating medications are effective, at least in part, for symptoms of schizophrenia.